sleep. Let's go through some of the papers uh, in more detail. Noah Kagali, Conservative councillor and political commentator with Young Voices UK joins me. Noah, good morning. Good morning, how are you? We are learning about the huge cost to the economy and to the NHS in treating something that is preventable, obesity. 3,000 ward emissions a day, and that's a doubling in the figure in the last six years. What do you think has gone wrong here? Yeah, it's an incredible amount, isn't it, really? And, and that's three times as many daily emissions as smoking, which is, I think, possibly the most shocking thing there. I think we all go about in our day-to-day -day lives kind of assuming that that is obviously one of the most, you know, the highest pressure pressure points on the NHS. But when when something like obesity is, is bringing in th three times as many people, then it, it does suggest that's something that uh, we should be potentially putting even more focus on from a public from a public policy standpoint um and that, that includes 20 children a day um which is also obviously a huge problem and i think the solution to this has to come from multiple angles it can't just be i think what have broadly been termed you know is sin taxes where we where we kind of try and devoid life of all of all joy and chocolate um but we also have to look at the amount of exercise people are doing and, and look, at, look at this holistically um, from their entire lifestyle, um, not just you know <laughs> getting rid of all the fun, all the fun food in life. Yeah, no, is that good enough? I mean, Victoria Atkins, the health secretary, has said she doesn't want to impose what could be nanny statish measures, and to focus on healthy living. That that hasn't really worked. The focus on healthy living. And and I suppose this is this is a problem that, from a political philosophy standpoint, we we've got to grapple with. Because we have a socialised healthcare system, but in this country we also believe in in personal responsibility. You run into this into this problem quite often, where there is a difference in, you know, we believe in in, in liberal values and people being able to do what they want, but at the same time, the state also takes a burden, or you know, is shouldering the burden of of those decisions. Would you welcome, for example, like a watershed on junk food advertising, not before nine pm? I, and not personally, I think, there, look, I very much enjoy McDonald's, I enjoy a KFC, but at the same time, I know that I can't eat it all the time and I do exercise. It is something that is achievable. Um, we just need to make sure that people are making healthy choices. How and do you do that? that? I, I suppose just impose limits on myself um, and take responsibility personally for my own health. And I, you know, I'm not amazing all the time, I'm not in, in perfect condition, um, but it's something that is doable and lots of people do do it. We just need to need to remind people the impact that things might have on their health um, and expect them to make the decision. OK, so from your perspective, it comes down to personal responsibility. We will uh, put that to the uh, National Obesity Forum in about 15 minutes time. Other stories uh, this morning. Um, Michelle Moan, front page of The Guardian today. Uh, she told the truth yesterday. Uh, is that enough for you? I suppose it's better late than never. Um, but admitting lying to the press, which she is right in saying is, isn't a crime in itself, um, it's still not a particularly good look. It is essentially just lying to the public. Um, and she is under criminal investigation, so we'll see where that goes, really. Um, but it, I, I, I'm still struggling to understand why she thought it was a good idea to go on TV at this point um, and start you know, professing her innocence whilst admitting that she lied. It, it just seems an odd way of going about trying to you know, you try to court public public affection. What do you think the consequence should be? Well, I suppose that's that's for the criminal investigation, really. Um, we can't start prosecuting people for just lying to the press. Unfortunately, that's not that's you know that's not really something we can do. But if crimes have been committed, I'm sure they will they will come out, mm. um, and that's where the focus needs to be. Yeah, um, she, not she said fact, very clearly, look, to lying to the press is not a crime. Um, you know, whether she's won over any of the public with the interview she made yesterday uh, will be interesting. Um, Oliver Dowden, inside at the Times this morning, uh, we know the Rwanda plan, well, last week, this time last week, extremely testy, we were rather nervous about that if you were a Conservative MP who wanted to support uh, the Prime Minister. Apparently, the budget to tackle migration has got no limit. Is that right? Well, it's it's odd because he said that you know they, they will spend whatever is necessary to get Rwanda to get the Rwanda plan off the ground, so to speak, um, which is fairly inconsistent messaging. With a few weeks ago, um, cleverly going around saying that it wasn't the be all and end all, and I think this is the problem the government run into over the over the Rwanda scheme specifically 
is that some ministers are saying this is, you know, the only thing that matters. And then some are saying, you know, this actually isn't the solution to everything. Um, and it's the inconsistent messaging that I think is the problem for the government over immigration now, is that they're promising big things, not necessarily achieving them. But when they do achieve something like the fairly successful um, Albania deal, it, they don't talk about it because they've put too much of their time, say, into something like Rwanda. And this is the problem that the government's going to have to deal with in the run-up to the election, is pointing to you know, areas where they might have succeeded, but if Rwanda hasn't, it's going to look like a failure because that's the messaging that they've been giving out. But at and this that, point, Noah, do you think the Rwanda plan's been good value for money? Well, no, nobody's gone to Rwanda, so even if you supported the Rwanda scheme, then I don't think anybody can argue that it has been. Um, you know, whether it actually will be a success, um, you know, that's up in the air. Um, because it hasn't actually happened yet. Fundamentally, we're talking about paying Rwanda money and not really getting anything out of it at the moment. Even if you, you know, support the scheme, you can see that. Something that's been really controversial, we just mentioned it with uh, Martina, is schools saying to the government, we desperately need guidance, we need advice. When we have issues around gender identity in the classroom, it is extremely challenging. Please issue us the advice. The front page of the Times has got details of what some of that will look like. Long-awaited advice for these uh, school leaders. What do you make of it? So I, I think the focus of the advice has been on the informing parents section, which obviously... Um, I think campaigners have raised as an issue that there may have been situations that have arisen where uh, people are socially transitioning at school or children are socially transitioning at school and it's not the information is not making its way back to the parent mm. um, and that that is a major concern. The response from, I think, some teachers on the other side of this debate and on, you know, probably on the other side of not the government side have suggested that that's broadly because of safeguarding issues and that they believe um, that the parents think that their social transition is as a result of, I think they've used the word social contagion, um, and will pull out, pull their children out of school as a result, and that they want to avoid that at all costs. But, you know, fundamentally, I think the government needs to be quite clear um, that parents do need to be informed, um, and that it's not up to teachers to, you know, start parenting children that they're on their own. Mm. Um, and that's going to be the focus of the advice as well as the fact that this is guidance, not, you know, it's not statutory, it's not the law, um, and the teachers are going to be expected, as I suspect, I expect um, to exercise their own judgment on this. Yeah, but the, one of the key things is that schools are not going to be obliged to let children change their gender identity. So it kind of gives, I guess, responsibility to the schools to say, okay, we don't we don't have to do this, but the schools are saying we need some kind of specific scenarios and examples because how do we then decide? Yeah, and I, I suppose what one could frame this as a little bit of a cop-out um, that, that is kind of getting put onto the schools. Um, but on the other hand, it is those schools that know their students um, and this gives them the, the freedom to be able to make those choices um, with those students at heart rather than it coming top-down from government who mm -hmm. don't know those people um, and don't know the situations. Um, to to impose the rules on them, it allows the schools and the, the parents, you know, hopefully, and the students to find find the best outcome um, and move in a direction mm -hmm. that's that's better for everybody, rather than you know blindly following guidance or blindly following rules government imposed from the top down, and that may not be the best thing in that scenario. Mm -hmm. There's a really interesting legal case on the front page of the Times. Customers are being sued for leaving negative reviews about a cosmetic surgery clinic online. So they sort of went on Facebook and wrote, obviously, what happened to them and what they didn't like. And um, they're being pursued through the courts, accused of defamation and harassment. Um, what's your kind of gut reaction to this case? You know, do you think it's it should be a place, if you want to leave a review, that you can do so without being fearful? You're going to be sued for, for defamation. If you believe you were telling Absolutely. the truth. Absolutely. Uh, and the Free Speech Union have expressed their concern. And, and my immediate reaction was almost one of confusion, I suppose, because I'd, I'd always assumed that you had some kind of you know, legal protection in a review that you weren't going to, the company or the, the restaurant or the shop wasn't going to come after you. Um, and that is a concern. And I do hope this goes absolutely nowhere. Um, but if it looks like it does, the government, you know, from a policy perspective, really do need to get a handle on that because we can't end up in a situation where every bad review is, 
you know, he's getting jumped on by the business in question. Yeah, and you um, need it. I mean, before I, if I was going to have any cosmetic surgery, which I'm not planning on doing, I might want to read reviews of other people who'd previously been to that place to find out whether I should go there or not. Um, final thing, Noah. Uh, Kevin Mayer's written in the Times 2 this morning. This is about the fact that uh, Prince George may end up going to a mixed school. His experience was, I think it's fair to say, pretty negative. Should we just have a look at this? Um, he says, I was unceremoniously dropped into an all-male, hormone fueled single-sex hellhole. Picture it, literally hundreds of boils, all with alarming quantities of testosterone, all flicking spit and pens and panting gormlessly at any female teacher, unlucky enough to be sentenced to stand before this this throng. I mean, some of the adjectives are quite grim, are quite grim for five o'clock in the morning. He says he hated going to an all-boys school. Do you have strong views either way as to whether it's right or wrong to, to mix genders in education? I, I'd probably say it very much depends on the person and where the school is. So I, I was at a boarding school in the middle of nowhere in Scotland, which was absolutely brilliant. It was mixed. Um, but if it had only been boys and I suppose just forests and hills, then that might have been a bit tough because you just don't get a way to integrate into normal society. Um, and I suppose that that might be the difference is that I would assume lots of single gender schools do find ways to to l allow their pupils to interact with people of the opposite gender. Do you think you um, worked harder because there were cool. girls in your classroom? Um, That's often the theory, isn't it? That boys work harder when there are girls around and it impacts girls' performance uh, worse. Yeah, potentially. Um, and that that may be true, but I don't think that the only outcome from school should only be academic result. It is also forming you as a person and allowing you to, you know, transition from school into university, working life, whatever it is, and and be the best person for that. Um, so only look at the academics might, in my mind, be slightly narrow mm. in the way that we analyse the success of single sex schools. Very good point. Noah, thank you so much. Noah Kagali, Conservative councillor and political commentator.